Hi there, this is Colin McGarry with Walking D-Day. You might well have seen the film The Dirty Dozen. It featured Lee Marvin, Charles Bronson and many other famous actors at the time. Now the storyline was that there were 12 convicts who were given a highly dangerous mission behind enemy lines and if they were successful they would be pardoned. This film was based loosely on the real people in the filthy 13 except they weren't convicts and they weren't always 13. Now Jake McNeese had volunteered for the army after Pearl Harbor and he insisted he would only go into the paratroopers so he ended up in the 506 and he was at Camp Tukawa. Now many of these men had grown up in the Dust Bowl in the 1930s. Intensive farming had left the land completely infertile. This led to famine and great social turmoil. So these men were pretty rough and ready. And the men that became the Filthy 13 were rougher than most. Unruly elements with the paratroopers were often shunted into being pathfinders or demolition men, which was the most dangerous section. McNeese spent most of his time trying to do everything against army regulations and he spent quite a lot of time in the stockade. But paratroopers go away with quite a lot. When the men moved to Fort Bragg, the demolition men were taught to destroy and drive trains. It was thought this might be useful if they found trains behind enemy lines after the invasion. Now one night, McNeese had been into town and he missed the return shuttle to camp. So he sat in a cafe, having a drink, and he was watching shunting locomotives in the, in the uh, shunting yard. He saw one that was fired up and nobody was in it. And so he got in it and he drove it off down the line. Now he stopped the train on the track near the camp and left it there and went back to camp. Because they never found out who took the train, the whole company was confined to quarters. Now in September 1943, they left the United States to go to England in the steamship Samaria. Now a demolition platoon has three sections of 13 men. Three rangers joined the platoon and one of them, Jack Womer, was in the section that became the field C-13. Jack Womer had been in the 29th Division and they'd formed another Ranger Battalion to replace Rangers that had gone to North Africa. Now this Ranger Battalion was called the 29th. So Jack Womer was in that and of course they were being trained by British commandos. Now he did very well in this training. He was going to become an instructor but then the 29th Battalion was disbanded and so he was no longer a ranger. One of his mates in the rangers, Bill Myers, had joined 101st and so Jack Womer thought he'd do the same. Now in the interview they asked him if he had any specialities and because Bill Myers was a demolition man he said demolition and so they put him in the demolition section but not in the same one as Bill Myers he was in the filthy 13 section. The barracks was in the grounds of a country home at Littlecott. Water was rationed and they were allowed one cold shower a week which required queuing for three hours. That's when they stopped washing. Although not exactly. When they had some leave they would go to London with clean clothes in their bag, take a shower in the Red Cross place and go to Piccadilly to find the girls. Now before they left England for Normandy, Jake McNeese had read about France being infested with lice. So that worried him a bit. When they were in the States, he got out of going to religious ceremonies by saying that he was a nature worshipper because his mother was an Indian. And so he sort of expanded on this and he thought, well, if I shave the side of my head that will keep lice off it and so he gave himself a mohawk haircut and then when he explained to the others why he'd done it 
they all wanted one. So they all had mohawk haircuts, except Jack Womer. He was more of a regular uh, GI. And then just before they actually left England, going into the plains, uh, of course the, the paratroopers had black grease paint on as camouflage, and the, all the planes had been painted with white stripes. The paint was still wet, and so they added to the uh, image of being Indians by putting this finger in the white paint and adding that onto their black. There were photos taken of this, and it wasn't until after the war that McNeese realised that this had been featured on the Stars and Stripes. They had been part of the HQ Battalion with the mission of supporting Colonel Sink's HQ. Just before D-Day, McNeese was asked to take over Sergeant Davidson's 3rd Battalion objective of setting explosives on the bridges at Breville. They left England at 11pm British time, headed across the channel. Uh, Magnese, looking down onto the ships going across, he was amazed that there could be so many ships. To him it looked like you could walk from one to the other on foot. Now the missions of the Airborne have laid out in this video here, but I'll go over it quickly. Now the 82nd were to land both sides of the Murderay and they were to capture St Mary Glees and two bridges on the Merdere to stop the Germans coming towards Utah Beach and to use these bridges for the 4th Division to head across the Chobol Peninsula. The 101st were landing further south and east. They were to capture the lanes coming off of Utah Beach through the marshes and two bridges on the River Douve and the lock that controlled the floods. The 3rd Battalion commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Wolferton, had the task of taking the two wooden bridges. One was a road bridge and one was a footbridge. They were to capture the bridges, then take the high ground around Breville, where it was planned for the forces from Omaha Beach and Utah Beach to meet up. The Filthy 13 and other demolition teams were to set charges on the bridges and only blow them up if the Germans risked taking them and using them to attack Utah Beach. The drops were highly dispersed. Lieutenant Colonel Wolverton landed near saint Combe du mont and was shot whilst hanging in an apple tree. Other officers that could have taken over the command were either killed or taken prisoner. It fell to Captain Shettle to lead the attack. McNeese's plane was losing height. That meant the pilot couldn't dip the nose as they jumped to help them miss the tailplane. Jake McNeese shouted, we've got to get out of here. So they started jumping. As they were shuffling forward, Jake was in the middle of the stick and some shrapnel came through the floor of the aeroplane, just missed him. It hit the belly chute of Piccadilly Willy and his chute started billowing out with all the wind in the plane. McNeese jumped, Piccadilly Willy was trying to control his parachute. He went forward and passed the door to allow the others behind him to get out. But that made a gap of about a minute and at over 100 miles an hour, a minute means over two miles. So the stick was highly dispersed. McNeese and the first nine men landed near St Mary Glees, eight miles from the bridges. They were in Hornet's nest of Germans and were attacked immediately. This dispersed the men during the next two hours, the only person McNeese saw was Lulop, who had fallen on a tarmac road and broken his back. He was beyond help. McNeese found himself in the junction of three hedges, being fired on by Germans from both sides. Now he fired back, and the Germans retreated each time, cursing as he went. But then they started coming again. They realised he couldn't hold out much longer. Now in the gloom of the night, across the lane, he could see an opening in a field, and there was a foxhole there, and he was sure there was a German in it. 
So he decided to fix his bayonet and he was going to dash across and attack that German in the foxhole. So he dashed across the lane and as he went he heard somebody call out flash and as he jumped in the foxhole he deviated his bayonet so he didn't spike the guy and landed next to another paratrooper. He said why didn't you respond to my clicks? And the guy says, well, I thought you were a German playing tricks. And all I've got is a belt of machine gun bullets. Nothing else. So McNeese gave him two grenades. And he said, let's go. So they started moving out. They heard some men making a noise in the floods. McNeese said, that must be stupid paratroopers making that much noise. One of them had joined up the same time as McNeese at Camp Tokoa. The group came up to a German command post. They spread out around it, then fired on it from all sides before disappearing on their way, leaving the Germans in utter confusion. And they met Colonel Johnson near the Barquette Lock, which is here. And he, he said to McNeese, go and set up a defence position on the perimeter. McNeese says, our objective is the bridges at Brethren. We needed there to blow them up. Johnson said, oh, that order's been superseded. Go and set up a defence position. So McNeese led his men towards the perimeter and then he just carried on towards the bridges. McNeese and his group arrived near the bridge at 3am. He had 13 men, most of them demolition men, but not all his original group. Before takeoff, McNeese had put on the maximum of clothing so he could have less in his backpack. He had put on his woolen OD uniform under his jumpsuit. It was soaking wet, making moving difficult. The only way to dry it was to take it off. He laid it out on the grass and would turn it over several times to dry both sides. Just 10 minutes later, a mortar came in and landed right in the middle of it. There was nothing left. The mortar had thrown up grit from the ground. McNeese was blinded until the watering of his eyes cleared them. But he still had lots of little bits in his face. So the first thing he did was to dig a six foot deep foxhole to get in it. Now once he was in it, comfortably he wanted some chewing tobacco and before he left England He'd taken out his K-rations out of his pockets and he'd filled them up with chewing tobacco in cardboard boxes. And of course, being in the swamps for hours, they just melted, so he had nothing left. No rations, no chewing tobacco, no water, even though you could hear the water of the river. Nothing. Now Jack Andrews, who they'd met up with, he had a shoe polish sized tin of cheese and so they broke that in half and shared it. Now because the uh, superior officers had been killed or captured it fell to Captain Shettle to command the attack on the bridges. Now on the way to the bridge, he actually got there at 5am, on the way there he met another group with uh, Sergeant Bennett, who was a mortar man, and Sergeant Bennett's group They'd actually picked up a German paratrooper. He'd been following them for some time before they realised what he was and that he wanted to surrender. He'd actually deserted a few days earlier and said he was waiting for them. By then there was about 40 men at the bridge. Quite a few demolition men, including the incomplete Filthy 13. Now charges were laid on the bridges ready for them to be blown up if the Germans risk taking them. At 5am, Lieutenant Christensen wanted to organise a party to go across the bridge to test the German defences. Now Zahn volunteered and then Di Carlo was told to volunteer. Finally there was a group of five, Arminio, Manio and Sergeant Barlow. Now Zahn ran across the bridge, followed by Di Carlo, 
and when they were three quarters of the way across they jumped off the side into the mud. So they're going upstream which is this way. And you can see there's lots of muddy because the, the tide's low. They're going upstream and then Di Carlo was shot by a German who was peeping over the side of the canal. Now he was just about to shoot him again but Zahn came running back so the German panicked and ran away and Zahn shot him as he was running away. Now the men, the five men, or the other four as you see, they wandered out to get Di Carlo back across the bridge. He could crawl so they found a plank which used to slide along between the supporting girders of the bridge and then push the plank farther. While all this was going on, Barlow was calling instructions to Bennett's mortar team which was supporting them. Di Carlo did get back and was taken to the aid station at the Fort Town farm. He had another unreal experience a few days later, but that will be another video. Now, although the demolition charges were placed on the bridges, they were never used to blow them up. But on the 7th, because there was no communication between HQ and Captain Shettle, they assumed that either they'd failed in their mission to get to the bridges, or they'd been in annihilated. So they sent some P-47s in to destroy the bridges. Now they approached from across Brevon, which is that way, and they flew right across and then they came back across Fort Town Farm which is over there and the first plane dropped a bomb which hit the road bridge and the second plane the bomb missed and the third plane started tumbling and the, he dropped his bombs and as the plane was tumbling it hit one of the bombs so that blew up. Now the planes disappeared again then they came back and they started strafing. Now Ed Shames, he jumped in the foxhole with the chaplain. Now he jumped down and he set off an orange smoke flare and he's wafting the smoke around and the planes broke off the attack. Now in all this attack only one man was killed, surprisingly enough. Now that was the road bridge. Now the footbridge, which is just here, that was attacked later on by some Mustangs, and so that was destroyed. So uh, there are no bridges to guard anymore. Now some veterans say it was five days before they were relieved, but the official history and the very comprehensive book by Ian Gardner on the 3rd Battalion, they say they were relieved on the 8th, so that's three days. Another well-known member of the Filthy 13 was Jack Womer. He was 16th in the line to jump, so 7th behind Piccadilly Willie, who had problems with his belly chute. Womer landed several miles from Jack McNeese and was in the floods. He was in water up to his chin. He tried moving to a shallower place, but wasn't sure which way to go, and was slipping in the mud. He discarded his heavy charges, but still risked drowning. Fortunately, the wind got in his parachute and pulled him like a surfer to a shallower spot. As the wind was picking up again, he cut his risers so he wouldn't get pulled into deep water again. He started moving around carefully, using his cricket every now and again. Then he had two clicks in reply. The other guy was 501st. They gradually collected more men. One was a 501 lieutenant and one was the Navy lieutenant who jumped with Womer. Nobody knew which way to go. Womer's ranger training came in useful here. He scrutinised the surrounds and saw a tree. That was probably on higher ground. He told the others to stay put and went to reconnoitre. He found dry land and a road with a telephone cable lying along it. A paratrooper must have been there and so there were no mines on the road. He went back to bring the others out. He now wanted to leave them to go and find his unit. The 501st lieutenant said, no, you must stay with them. He instructed Womer, who was just a private, to take six of his men one way and he'd go the other way 
to find out what was there. Rome was leading them along the road when he realised that this was a bad place to be. He went into the ditch to advance. The men didn't see any reason for that and carried on on the road. They all got cut down by a machine gun. Womer went back to find the lieutenant. The lieutenant wanted to skirt round the machine gun by going into the field. Womer said that that would give them no cover, but the drainage ditch would. So they followed the ditch. And the ditch actually led them down to the river bank. Just over there. You see there's a levee by the river. Now all the men were bunched up around the lieutenant. Romer said, you need to spread out, otherwise one grenade can kill us all. Now the lieutenant wanted to go and get the machine gun. And Romer said, we'd be better off here making a defence position for the locks. The Germans can only come at us from two sides, so we're well protected. But the lieutenant wanted to go and get the machine gun. So they moved off across the marshes. And then suddenly a flare went up. Now the American doctrine and the British commando doctrine differ on what happens when the flare goes up. The Americans, you freeze and the enemy would take you for a post or a tree. Of course, there are not many posts or trees in this landscape. But the British commando doctrine is, if the flare goes up, you splay it on the ground. So Woma splayed out on the ground, all the others stayed frozen standing up, they were all cut down except three. So now there was just Woma and three other men to carry on. Now they carried on, they got to near a wood, the men wanted to go into the wood. Woma said, well the Germans will surely search into a wood, if we go in the wheat field we can hide in there, they won't bother searching a whole field of wheat. But the two went in and Womer and Mould went into the field. And the, the two that went into the woods, they never saw them again. After some time, they'd been fired on a bit because he stuck his head up out the wheat. They had to change position. They saw some paratroopers in the distance, so they went off to meet them. So there was a captain leading this group and they had a medic with them. And once again, Womer said they should stay in the ditch rather than being on the road. So that's what they did. So with this group, they were now going back the way the Womer and Mole had come from. And then they saw a farmhouse off the road. They'd noticed it before. So they approached it and Womer and Mole went in. And they thought they'd been firing coming from the house, but nobody was firing at them just now. They went in. There was a Frenchman and an enormous barrel of wine, or well, probably cider. He was very friendly, and he was indicating they should go upstairs. So Roma was a bit suspicious. He forced the Frenchman to go up. He didn't want to go up, but they forced him to. When his head got to the level of the upper floor, he was shot in the head and fell down the stairs. So Roma threw a grenade up, dashed up, found two dead Germans there. So the captain said, we, we use this as a command post and an aid station. Now the captain sent Womer out to find the colonel. He didn't say which colonel. It wasn't until later that he realised he must have been talking about Colonel Johnson. He said he came along this road towards Hell's Corner and then went on towards Penem. Now Womer says he comes up to this junction here which was going to be Hell's Corner. That's how he described it, because that was later on. But he says he came up the road, which would be this one, and that would have come past the Barquette Lock. And he says there was a, a road on the left which went perpendicularly from the river, which is to our right. And there was a road to the right, which went towards the channel. Which would be that one. Just near here, he finds a paratrooper covered in a parachute. And he took the parachute off the guy and asked him what has happened. He said, our medic came to me 
and he said he'd come back. He put this parachute over me. And Wilma said, when was that? Oh, he said it must have been about midday. That was seven hours earlier. So the poor guy had been there seven hours. So Wilma left him there. He said, I'll come back for you. And he carried on to look for the Colonel. So Wilma carried on. And then he saw a ditch like this, full of paratroopers. There must have been 20 or so of them. He said, any 506 men here? And about 12 put their hands up. So he said, well, come with me. And they followed him. And he took them back to the command post for the 501st captain. So he was pleased he had some reinforcements. And on the way back, they picked up the paratrooper, which had been here, the wounded one, and took him back to the command post aid station. So the captain had more reinforcements. On the morning of the 7th, the captain said to Woma, he told him all that Mole had told about what Woma had done since he landed, getting the men out of the swamps and saving men's lives. He said he was going to write a report and that Woma would get credit for it. Woma saw himself being promoted and then transferred. But that never happened because an hour later, the captain was killed by a sniper. Woma didn't take part in the Hell's Corner action, but was witness to it. The 1st Battalion of the 6th German Parachute Regiment was trying to retreat from near St. Mary de Mont. They made a beeline across the swamps towards Carentin Church Spire. After a fierce battle, the Germans, who were superior in number, were bluffed into surrendering. 350 prisoners were taken. They were lined up on the road to be taken to Fortan Farm when German shells came in and killed many of them. Veterans are often oblivious or biased about what other units accomplished. There's an example of this in Jake McNeese's book. He says the 501st and 502nd had failed to take Carentan so they sent the 506th in to do the job. The action he's talking about is the three days of combat along the road to Carentan, which became known as Purple Heart Lane. Starting on the 9th of June, by the 11th, they had a hold on the outskirts of Carentan and had pushed Colonel van der Heet to pull out of Carentan. So when the 506 did go in, they were facing a much reduced force. In his account, Jake McNeese doesn't say clearly, but it seems he was back in the HQ of the 506, because he took part in the attack on Carentan, and he was guarding Colonel Sink. The 3rd Battalion were in reserve at the time. They came back in for the Battle of Bloody Gulch, or Bloody Gully as they called it. McNeese does mention a German, who tried a trick of walking down the street in Carentan with clogs on, so as to pass for a civilian, and then fire on the paratroopers. Now Jack Womo had been with the 501st, he actually took part in the attack on Carentan and the Bloody Gulch, but he puts his short account puts it into one continuous battle from the 8th of June till the 13th when they were relieved by the Second Armoured Division. The day after Bloody Gulch, Jack Womer met up with Jake McNeese again and Joe Walensky. Now Joe told him that um, Goo Goo and Pee Pee Nuts had been killed. They then found the body of Goo Goo, but uh, Womer went out to see where it happened he actually found the body, so he recovered the dog tags. On the 20th, Woma and Magnese had gone into town to get their hair cut. There's a medal ceremony going on for soldiers, including Robert Wright, the medic from Angerville, and Sergeant Barlow of the 3rd Battalion. 
shells started to come in from German artillery. A flare had been sent up from Carentin to indicate the range. When we went to where the flare had gone up from and saw a Frenchman with German boots on coming out of the house. We grabbed him. The Frenchman proclaimed his innocence even though Wilma was beating him. GI is on a truck nearby were shouting, kill him, when we wasn't sure what to do. An elderly lady came by, we had met a few days earlier. She assured him that the man had nothing to do with it. He handed him over to the MPs. So a few days later, he went to see the MPs to check what happened to the man. And he'd done nothing wrong, they said. So one was glad he hadn't been influenced by the crowd and shot the guy. And with the capture of Carentin, under the first to complete their mission, they moved to near Utah Beach before going back to England to prepare for Market Garden. So what really made the Filthy 13 legendary? It was because they were filthy, didn't wash, they were unruly, more than others. And then Jake Menice had the idea of the mohawk haircut, so the others did. And then just before they left, they put the extra white paint on top of the black grease paint. All that was featured in the Star and Stripes. This monument was put up in Brevin in 2008. They didn't actually come here, but the other side of the canal, where they were, is private property and not accessible to the public. Now Jack Womer died in 2013, he'd asked to be cremated and his family got permission for the urn of his ashes to be incorporated into the monument.